Hi, I'm Phil Webb, Principal Consultant with Select Business Solutions. Why do we model systems? The ultimate answer is to improve them, in line with some business objective. There are other shorter answers also. To model what the business does now, to understand the system, to identify its problems and shortcomings, to identify requirements, and to specify an improved system. We'll look at all of these as we use some splendid techniques to model the system. These techniques have been used in IT for decades, are well tried and tested, and despite the increasing popularity of the Unified Modeling Language, or UML, are still preferred by many business and system analysts today. The next question to ask is what aspects of a system do we model? We can identify a generic model of any computer program. A program is a collection of lines of code, no matter what type of program we care to think about. Code is all about doing something, actions to be taken. In other words, it's all about process. The arrow on this diagram to the right of the process is labelled output. In other words, the entire raison d'etre for the program to produce some information that is of value to the business. This could be a statement to be sent to a customer, the quantity of available stock of an item held in stores, confirmation of change to a customer's credit limit. It's whatever we want it to be. Now, you can't produce something from nothing, and so that computer program needs something on which to work, something to start off that process. In other words, input the arrow to the left of the diagram. Using the examples of output we discussed, the input could be an order, a simple inquiry quoting a product number, or the level to which credit control wishes to set for this customer. OK, so far so good. But we don't always expect the output straight away. Sometimes the required output would be a statement about all the orders received from a given customer during this month. So what we do then is store up those orders until we're ready to produce the statement, perhaps at month's end. This is what is shown by the two arrows underneath the process box. Data being stored into a database and data being retrieved from the database. Both storage and retrieval of data involves process, that is, code. What this means is that our generic picture, while still true, is actually a simplification of what we see here. In other words, instead of one program, we have several, a suite of programs. Some will be accepting input data, verifying it, perhaps against other data already held on the database, then storing that data for later use. Other programs will be retrieving that data, manipulating it according to some business rules, and producing the required information to be of use to the business. This model holds true no matter what application area we're working in, and whether or not the programs will be bespoke or provided by commercial off-the-shelf or COTS application packages. Now you might be wondering, we're only in the investigation and analysis phase of our project here. Isn't it a bit early to be thinking about computer programs? You're of course quite right. We shouldn't be assuming that there must definitely be an IT solution as yet, even if it's highly likely. We're only discussing concepts at the moment, and it turns out that what we're likely to end up specifying, a computer program, is a useful place to start. The nice thing is, the generic models we've just seen aren't just a generic picture of an IT system. They're the model of a business system. It's business systems that are the province of both business analysts and systems analysts. The best way to think about the business system under study in any given project is to think of it as what Professor Peter Checkland of Lancaster University calls a human activity system. In other words, people working together in a hopefully coordinated way in order to achieve some common objective. That's an excellent description of any business environment you can think about whether it's in the private sector or the public sector. The important thing to remember is that it's people carrying out business activities, usually involving data, 
to meet the needs of the business. We need to understand the manual elements of this, together with any IT support that might already be in place. Fortunately, a range of methods of modelling have been developed over the past three decades, and in this module, we'll be exploring a set of three structured methods that allow you to cover all of these elements. Modelling process with data flow diagrams, data with entity relationship diagrams, and behaviour with entity life histories. As you'll find out in other modules in this series covering more contemporary modelling techniques, this multi-aspect approach to modelling provides benefits in terms of covering the range of elements we need to model, but also by allowing the elements to be cross-referenced and validated against each other through the varied modelling methods. The sessions within this module on conventional methods will cover the techniques employed by the SSADM, the Structured Systems Analysis and Design Method, using its notation for the data flow diagram, entity relationship diagram, and entity life history diagrams to describe these three key aspects of process, data, and behaviour. <laughs>